in your Nobel Prize lecture, you propose what I think is a super interesting conjecture that, quote, any pattern that can be generated or found in nature can be efficiently discovered and modeled by a classical learning algorithm. What kind of patterns of systems might be included in that? Biology, chemistry, physics, maybe cosmology, yep. neuroscience, what, what are we talking about? Sure. Well, look, I felt that it's sort of a tradition, I think, of Nobel Prize lectures that you're supposed to be a little bit provocative. And I wanted to follow that tradition. What I was talking about there is if you take a step back and you look at um, all the work that we've done, especially with the Alpha X projects. So I'm thinking Alpha Go, of course, Alpha Fold. What they really are is we're building models of very combinatorially high dimensional spaces that, you know, if you try to brute force a solution, find the best move and go, or find the the exact shape of a protein. And if you enumerated all the possibilities, you'd, there wouldn't be enough time in the, in the, you know, the time of the universe. So you have to do something much smarter. And what we did in both cases was build models of those environments. Um, and that guided the search in a, in a smart way. And that makes it tractable. So if you think about protein folding, which is obviously a natural system you know why should that be possible how does physics do that you know proteins fold in milliseconds in our bodies so somehow physics solves this problem that we've now also solved computationally and i think the reason that's possible is that in nature natural systems have structure because they were subject to evolutionary processes that that shaped them and if that's true then you can maybe learn uh, uh what that structure is so this perspective i think is a really interesting one You've hinted it, at it, which is almost like uh, crudely stated, anything that can be evolved can be efficiently modeled. I think there's some truth to that. Yeah, I sometimes call it survival of the stabilist or something like that, because, it, you know, it's, it's of course, there's evolution for life, uh, living things. But there's also, you know, if you think about geological time, so the shape of mountains, that's been shaped by weathering processes, right, over thousands of years. But then you can even take it cosmological, the orbits of planets, the um, shapes of asteroids. These have all been survived kind of processes that have acted on them many, many times. So if that's true, then there should be some sort sort of pattern um, that you can kind of reverse learn and uh, a kind of manifold really that helps you uh, uh, search to the right solution, to the right shape, um, and actually allow you to predict things about it uh, in an efficient way, because it's not a random pattern. Right, so um, it may not be possible for for man-made things or abstract things like factorizing large numbers, because unless there's patterns in the number space, which there might be, but if there's not and it's uniform, then there's no pattern to learn. There's no model to learn that will help you search. So you have to do brute force. So in that case, you you know you maybe need a quantum computer, something like this. But in most things in nature that we're interested in, uh, are not like that. They have structure um, that evolved for a reason and survived over time. And if that's true, I think that's potentially learnable by a neural network. It's like nature is doing a search process and it's so fascinating that it's in that search process is creating systems that could be efficiently modeled. Yes, it's right. Yeah. So interesting. So they can be efficiently rediscovered or recovered um, because nature is not random, right? These, the, everything that we see around us, including like the elements that are more stable, all of those things, they're subject to um, some kind of selection process, pressure. Do you think, because you're also a fan of theoretical computer science and complexity, do you think we can come up with a kind of complexity class, like a complexity zoo type of class where maybe it's the set of learnable systems, the set of learnable natural systems, LNS. Yeah. This is a <laughs> demos a new, class. <laughs> new class of systems that could be actually learnable by classical systems in this kind of way, natural systems that can be uh, modeled efficiently. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I've always been fascinated by the P equals MP question and what is modelable by classical systems, i.e. non-quantum systems, you know, Turing machines in effect. And that's exactly what I'm working on, actually, in kind of my few moments of spare time with a few colleagues about is should there be, you know, maybe a new class of problem that is solvable by this type of neural network process and kind of mapped onto these natural systems. So, you know, the things that exist in physics and have structure. So I think that could be a very interesting uh, new way of thinking about it. And it sort of fits with the way I think about 
about physics in general, which is that, you know, I think information is primary. Information is the most sort of fundamental unit of the universe, more fundamental than energy and matter. I think they can all be converted into each other. But I think of the universe as a kind of informational system. So when you think of the universe as an informational system, then the P equals MP question is a, is a physics question. That's right. It, and it's a question that can help us actually solve the entirety of this whole thing going on. Yeah, I think it's one of the most uh, fundamental questions, actually, if you think of physics as informational. Uh, and, and the answer to that, I think, is going to be, you know, very enlightening. More specific to the P and, and P question, this, again, some of the stuff we're saying is kind of crazy right now. Just like the Christian Edmondson Nobel Prize speech controversial thing that he said sounded crazy, and then you went, and got a Nobel Prize for this with John Jumper, solved the problem. So let me let me just stick to the P equals MP. Do you think there's something in this thing we're talking about that could be shown if you get, can do something like uh, polynomial time or constant time compute ahead of time and construct this gigantic model, then you can solve some of these extremely difficult problems in a theoretical computer science kind of way. Yeah, I think that there are a, actually a huge class of problems that could be couched in this way, the way we did AlphaGo and the way we did AlphaFold, where you know you you model what the dynamics of the system is, the the the, the properties of that system, the environment that you're trying to understand, and then that makes the search for the solution or the prediction of the next step efficient basically polynomial time, so tractable by a uh, classical system, uh, which a neural network is. It runs on normal computers, right? Classical computers, uh, Turing machines in effect. And um, I think it's one of the most interesting questions there is, is how far can that paradigm go? You know, I think we've proven, uh, and the AI community in general, that classical systems, Turing machines, can go a lot further than we previously thought. You know, they can do things like model the structures of proteins and play Go to better than world champion level. And, uh, you know, a lot of people would have thought maybe 10, 20 years ago, that was decades away, or maybe you would need some sort of quantum machines to to quantum systems to be able to do things like protein folding. And so I think we haven't really uh, even sort of scratched the surface yet of what uh, classical systems so-called uh, uh, could do. And of course, AGI being built on a on a neural network system on top of a neural network system on top of a classical computer would be the ultimate expression of that. And I think the limit, the, you know, the the what what the bounds of that kind of system, what it can do, it's a very interesting question and 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 directly speaks to the P equals MP question. What do you think, again, hypothetical, might be outside of this? Maybe emergent phenomena? Like if you look at cellular automata, mm -hmm. some of the, you have extremely simple systems and then some complexity emerges. Yes. Maybe that would be outside or even, would you guess even that might be amenable to efficient modeling by a classical machine? Yeah, I think those systems would be right on the boundary. Right, so um, I think most emergent systems, cellular automata, things like that, could be modelable by a classical system. You just sort of do a forward simulation of it, and it'd probably be efficient enough. Um, of course, there's the question of things like chaotic systems, where the initial conditions really matter, and then you get to some, you know, uncorrelated end state. Now, those could be difficult to model. So I think these are kind of the open questions. But I think when you step back and look at what we've done with the systems and the and the problems that we solved and then you look at things like vo3 on like video generation sort of rendering physics and lighting and things like that you know really in core fundamental things in physics um it's pretty interesting i think it's telling us something quite fundamental about how the universe is structured in my opinion um so you know in, in a way that's what i want to build agi for is to help uh, us uh, as scientists answer these questions uh like p calls mp yeah, I think we might be continuously surprised about what is modelable by classical computers. I mean, AlphaFold 3 on the interaction side is surprising that you can make any kind of progress on that direction. Alpha Genome is surprising that you can map the genetic code to the function. Kind of playing with the emergent kind of phenomena, you think there's so many combinatorial options, that, and then here you go. Yeah. You can find the kernel that is efficiently modeled. Yes, because there's some structure, there's some landscape, 
you know, in the energy landscape or whatever it is that you can follow, some gradient you can follow. And of course, what neural networks are very good at is following gradients. And so if there's one to follow and, object and you can specify the objective function correctly, you know, you don't have to deal with all that complexity, mm -hmm. which I think is how we maybe have naively thought about it for decades, those problems. If you just enumerate all the possibilities, it looks totally intractable. And there's many, many problems like that. And then you think, well, it's like 10 to the 300 possible protein structures, uh, it's 10 to the 100 and, you know, 70 possible go positions. All of these are way more than atoms in the universe. So how could one possibly find the the right solution or predict the next step and and it but it turns out that it is possible and of course reality nature does do it right proteins do fold so that that gives you confidence that there must be if we understood how physics was doing that uh in a sense uh then and we could mimic that process i.e., model that process uh it should be possible on our classical systems is 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 basically what the conjecture is about and of course, there's nonlinear dynamical systems, highly nonlinear dynamical systems, everything involving fluid. Yes, right. You know, I recently had a conversation with Terence Tao, who mathematically uh, it contends with a very difficult aspect of systems that have some singularities in them that break the mathematics. And it's just hard for us humans to make any kind of clean predictions about highly nonlinear dynamical systems. But again, to your point, we might be very surprised what classical learning systems might be able to do about even fluid. Yes, exactly. I mean, fluid dynamics, Navier-Stokes equations, these are traditionally thought of as very, very difficult, intractable kind of problems to do on classical systems. They take enormous amounts of compute, you know, weather prediction systems, you know, these kind of things all involve fluid dynamics calculations. And, um, but again, if you look at something like VO, our video generation model, it can model liquids quite well, surprisingly well. And materials, specular lighting. I love the ones where, you know, there's there's people who generate videos where there's like clear liquids going through hydraulic presses and then it's being squeezed out. I, I used to write uh, physics engines and graphics engines in, in my early days in gaming. And I know it's just so painstakingly hard to build programs that can do that. And yet somehow these systems are, you know, reverse engineering from just watching YouTube videos. So presumably what's happening is it's extracting some underlying structure around how these materials behave. So perhaps there is some kind of lower dimensional manifold that can be learned if we actually fully understood what's going on under the hood. That's maybe, you know, maybe true of most of reality. Yeah, I've been continuously, precisely by this aspect of VO3, I think a lot of people highlight different aspects, including the comedic and the meme yes. and all that kind of stuff. And then the ultra realistic ability to capture humans in a really nice way that's compelling and get, feels close to reality and then combine that with native audio. All of those are marvelous things about VO3, but the exactly the thing you're mentioning, which is the physics. Yeah. It's not perfect, but it's pretty damn good. And then the, the really interesting scientific question is what is it understanding about our world mm -hmm. in order to be able to do that? Because of the cynical take with the diffusion models, there's no way it understands anything. Mm -hmm. But it seems, I mean, I don't think you can generate that kind of video without understanding. And then our own philosophical notion of what it means to understand then is like brought to the surface. Like, do, To what degree do you think VO3 understands our world? I think to the extent that it can predict the next frames, you know, in a coherent way, that's some, that is a form, you know, of understanding, right? Not in the anthropomorphic version of, you know, it's not some kind of deep philosophical understanding of what's going on. I don't think these systems have that, but they, they certainly have uh, modeled enough of the dynamics, you know, put it that way, that they can pretty accurately generate whatever it is, eight seconds of consistent video that by eye, at least, you know, at a glance, is quite hard to distinguish what the issues are. And imagine that in two or three more years time. That's the thing I'm thinking about and how incredible that will, they will look, uh, given where we've come from, you know, the early versions of that uh, uh, one or two years ago. And so um, the rate of progress is incredible. And I think um, I'm like you, it's like a lot of people love all of the, 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 the stand-up comedians and the, the, the actually captures a lot of human dynamics very well and, and body language. But actually, the thing I'm most impressed with and fascinated by is the physics behavior, the lighting and materials and liquids. And it's pretty amazing that it can do that. And I think that shows it, that it has some notion of at least intuitive physics, 
right? Um, how things are supposed to work uh, intuitively, maybe the way that uh, a human child would understand physics, right? As opposed to a, you know, a PhD student really uh, being able to unpack all the equations. It's more of an intuitive physics understanding. Well, that intuitive physics understanding, that's the base layer. That's the thing people sometimes call like common sense. Mm -hmm. like it, it really understands something. I think that really surprised a lot of people. It blows my mind that I just didn't think it would be possible to generate that level of realism without understanding. Hmm. You, there's this notion that you can only understand the physical world by having an embodied AI system, a robot that interacts with that world. That's the only way to construct an understanding of that world. Yeah. But VO3 is directly challenging that, right. it feels like. Yes. And it's very interesting, you know, even if we, if you were to ask me five, 10 years ago, I would have said, even though I was immersed in all of this, I would have said, well, yeah, you probably need to understand intuitive physics. Yeah. You know, like if I push this off the table, this glass, it will maybe shatter, you know, um, and, the, and the liquid will spill out, right? So we know all of these things. But I thought that, you know, and there's a lot of theories in neuroscience, it's called action in perception, where, you know, you, you need to act in the world to really, truly perceive it in a deep way. And there was a lot of theories about you'd need embodied intelligence or robotics or something, or maybe at least simulated action uh, so that you would understand things like intuitive physics. But it seems like um, you can understand it through passive observation, which is pretty surprising to me. And and again, I think hints at something underlying about the nature of uh, reality. Reality, in, in, in my opinion, beyond um, just the, you know, the cool videos that it generates. Um, and, and of course, there's next stages is maybe even making those videos interactive. So uh, one can actually step into them and move around them, um, which would be really mind blowing, especially given my games background. <laughs> so you can imagine. Uh, and then and then I think, you know, you're, we're starting to get towards what I would call a world model, a model of how the world works, the mechanics of the world, the physics of the world, and the things in that world. And and of course, that's what you would need for a true AGI system.